I have to admit, I used to be a little bit of a book snob. I wouldn't even consider a Kindle, let alone an audiobook. It just felt like cheating. But that is until I tried Audible and Open Audible. Ever wonder where I find the time to read all the books that my guests have written on this show? Well, this is the answer. When I'm behind in my reading, I just jump to audiobook. Open Audible is a cross-platform audiobook manager designed for Audible users that can allow you to download, view, manage, and connect your favorite audiobooks on MP3 so that you can enjoy them across all your devices. Best of all, you can control it all from a desktop application. I'm giving away a copy of Open Audible for the entire month of November. All you have to do is sign up to my mailing list. You'll find the link in the description below or go to openaudible.org for more information. If you write articles or copy, or even work as an editor for a magazine, you're going to want to listen to this advert. Are you looking to save time writing online content? Well, Phosphor AI is an online service that will save you hours of work with your content creation. All you have to do is type in your title, and their AI software will get to work writing a high-quality original article just for you. You'll need to review the article and take 15 to 20 minutes to make necessary edits, but then the piece will be ready for publishing. Just for signing up, you'll get three free articles so you can try out Phosphor AI and see what it can do all for yourself. Why waste time writing online content yourself when you can get Phosphor AI to do it for you? Try out their service today and see just how much time you can save. That's Phosphor AI. Go to phosphorai.com. Okay. So, hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of Chatter. Today I'm here with Ben Joseph Stewart, filmmaker, uh, podcaster, and yeah, all around general creative, I think is what we've established in the last minute or two. <laughs> That's right. Thank you so much for having me, man. Yeah, not a problem. It's a pleasure to have you with, uh, have you with me, especially after we had the chat on, on your show last week and, and that, that, that felt somewhat incomplete. So, you know, now I get to ask you some questions, man. So that'll be really interesting. Uh, yeah, man. Let's dive in. I noticed in the uh, the topics you wanted to touch upon, I'm gonna go uh, a little deep down the rabbit hole. So I'm excited. Yes. Well, I mean, what are rabbit holes for except for diving down? Really, you know? Mm -hmm. I'm. There's a lot of people that happily board them all up. You know, like like the like a, I don't know, like an underground sewer that you never want to venture into, and there's lots of fun things down there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and lots of toxic things. You know, every rabbit hole has its uh, its light and its dark. And, yeah, um, I think it's it's the same thing as um, you know, maybe we'll talk about psychedelics, but psychedelics, you know, it's not just that they're they're net good or net negative. It's it's what you do when you're in that space. And I think rabbit holes are meant to be explored, but also meant to be left. <laughs> <laughs> You try living down there, you know, interesting stuff's going to happen with your mind and your, your social structure. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's definitely probably very true. Um, like when, what was your first rabbit hole? Well, hmm, I think this was around the age of 14. Um, there were a few, you know, when I was real young, I was obsessed with, indigenous cultures i lived in kwajalein uh, when i was like four or five years old and kwajalein is these little specklings uh of islands actually they're called the marshall islands and they're in between hawaii and micronesia three degrees above the equator mm -hmm. but there was a matriarchal shamanic society there called the marshallese and i got super obsessed with indigenous cultures because i sensed that they understood something about the forces of nature that i just didn't see flatly on the face of it um, and I, I wanted to know because I, I think I resonated with there, there's something deeper there that I can't sense, but I know it's possible to sense. Mm. So I think at a very early age, I started feeling that there was a much deeper, um, no ability to reality and the mind and nature. Um, but I didn't really hop down a rabbit hole until age 14 when I took some mushrooms and 14 was a good age for me because it was around 15 when all my friends started doing oxycontin and opiates and stuff like that and i just knew that opiates and stuff like that they did this they, they made you euphoric but they really kind of dimmed consciousness and psychedelics did the exact opposite they seemed to just crack open the mind and yeah there would be some difficult moments but you're seeing more than you could see before so i think from just understanding that indigenous 
saw deeper into nature, mushrooms kind of tapped me into, oh man, they must have been doing mushrooms. And um, it turns out it's not always mushrooms. It's not always even like a psychedelic. Um, sometimes it's their dances, it's their songs, it's their community, it's their ceremony. Um, but then I would say probably the deepest rabbit hole that I got into um, and it's something that really took a pivotal turn just yesterday, actually, is um, conspiracy. Hmm. And, you know, around age 23, 24, I got into conspiracy and I wasn't scared. I wasn't afraid about it, but I realized it was a lot of it's bullshit, but hmm. some of it is opening up this can of worms that you really don't know what the world is around you. You know what you've been told. You know what you've thought up. You know what has been spoon fed to you and pre digested for you, but you don't really understand what other people are doing around the world in private. Mm -hmm. So that sent me down a huge rabbit hole of really just like breaking down what Mark Gaffney, Rabbi Mark Gaffney, would call um, the third person perspective of reality when there's also first person and second person. And I'd never heard anyone put it that way. I'd I'd also, for the last couple of years, been thinking that, you know, every time somebody tries to explain away conspiracies with one blanket statement, it just never felt complete. It felt very intelligent. It felt, you know, um, very apropos for the conversation, but it never felt complete until I was listening to Mark Gaffney on Aubrey Marcus's podcast. He did a three-part series with him. And in part one, he touches upon conspiracy without a notion of dismissing it, but showing that there is a, a real, literal, factual basis to it, but it is incomplete because Newtonian this causes that kind of causality is a part of reality, but it's only one layer of reality. There's also the second person, which is me and you, like focused on one another, that's relational. And then there's also the first person, which is inner subjective. And these are more based upon story. So that's, you know, when speaking of rabbit holes, that was probably the biggest rabbit hole that I went into. And I didn't go the, you know, the lengths of constantly being buggy eyed and talking about, you know, certain classes of people with money and, and thousands of years of agenda mm -hmm. that's all culminating to right now. Um, it, it was really more like you, you just can't discount it all. And everybody that I saw, all the best and uh, analytical intellectual people, even Jordan Peterson, were like there's no such thing as conspiracy. It's all just ignorance and ineptitude that runs the show. And I was like, that just doesn't feel right. It doesn't feel it doesn't resonate with truth. There's probably ignorance and ineptitude rife throughout the system, but there's no way that that accounts for all the shit that happens. So. There's my answer. That's that was the biggest rabbit hole that I got into. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel like just recently I finally in kept it inclusive, but also transcended my my old beliefs about it. What do you, what did you mean? When, what do you mean when you say like it's all it's like, you know, become very real in the last couple of days? Like what specifically? I would say for the past couple of years, I've been doing podcasts with people that, you know, they're like, oh, so I, I see the first couple films that you made. You, you're talking about these very specific conspiracies. And I'm like, you know, yeah, I did. And and that really served me and probably the audience for that time. But um, I'm not even here to try and prove specific things like, you know, oh, did, do you know what the Rockefellers did with um, homeopathy and how they brought in allopathic medicine and how this is disease management rather than mm -hmm. healing industry? Like all those things, they have their truth with them. But I, I stopped feeling the necessity, the inner impulse to prove any of those things. It, it was actually like actually post 2020. Everyone was was diving into conspiracy so much that my hipster came out and I was like, oh, it's too popular now. <laughs> it's 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 not fun to talk about. But really, it was also realizing that it's not pushing um, our collective story forward in a net benefit way, even though I knew you couldn't discount it. So I, there was this paradox inside me. I didn't know how to reconcile between nobody has at. at up to that point, up till yesterday when I was listening to that Aubrey Marcus podcast with Mark Gaffney, nobody had rightly put it where conspiracy actually 
exists inside the greater collective consciousness. Everybody else tried to discount it, saying it's just apophenia, meaning you're co you're connecting dots that don't need to be connected that way. And I know that's true for a lot of people. I also know that there is some truth to some of the things that some people are putting together. I just didn't know how to reconcile those two things. And that's why in the past few days, I've been really annoyed by conspiracy, specific conspiracy theories, even though I understand that the greater concept of why you would bring up the they, why you would bring that up, um, still has some relevance. Mm -hmm. And I think Mark Gaffney even said it. It's just like, it's not a myth. Conspiracy is not a myth. And even this idea of like the myth of separation, that we're all separate, you know, we're all skin encapsulated egos and there's no connection. It's like, no, we we are all one, but it's not a myth to say that we're separate. We're also separate. So it just, I would say Mark Gaffney really helped me kind of um, with my inner model. How do I model this new story that's emerging for me? And because I don't feel like throwing away this thing that very much so resonated and helped me, uh, honestly, conspiracy, getting into it, it, I never listened or paid attention in school, but I started reading books. I wanted to know about history. I was reading every topic under the sun, and that was thanks to conspiracy. But I also saw what it did to a lot of my friends. It caused them to be the guy at a party where everyone's telling dick and fart jokes. And this person's talking about building seven and nine 11, you know, with buggy eyes. And the person who's listening has their beer and is looking around like somebody, please save me. Right. Like that's what happened to most people down that rabbit hole. For me, I was in a band. My band would give me such shit. If I went on a monologue, they would give me such shit. So I learned how, like, how and when to bring up what. Mm. And that that helped me not ruin a lot of friendships along the way. But then deeper down the line, I started realizing my friends who are ignoring conspiracy aren't wrong either. They're not wrong for ignoring it. They're right in the sense that it's dominating you, Ben. It's dominating you. That's why I don't want to hear about it because of the way your eyes go, because of the way your tone of voice goes when you're talking about it, you cut off the intimacy between the second person. Our relational connection is gone because you're just in your head monologuing about the latest David Icke book that you read. <laughs> so that was a real humbling moment for me. But for years, I still couldn't reconcile it until just the past couple of days. Mm. So like, <clears throat> when you're saying that going like jumping down these rabbit holes that isn't isn't particularly useful or it isn't pushing what was the thing you said it wasn't pushing forward our collective story mm -hmm. like what do you mean by that because like isn't there isn't there a case to be made that that like pushing not even pushing but like at the source of i'd say well there's there's the paranoid schizophrenics right but then there's a lot of people who, especially in 2020, went diving down rabbit holes in an attempt to find truth um, mm -hmm. where they weren't being shown it by the, by the whatever you want to call it, the system, the powers that be, the, right. you know, Klaus Schwab's cigar club, like whatever way you want to define it. But that the, they weren't being told the truth by the, the, the mainstream and that people went searching for the truth. And mm -hmm. I would argue that that those people searching for the truth were, in a way, attempting to push forward our collective story because they, in themselves, were were seeking the truth, and that is, in my sense, the the foundation upon which our society at least ought to be built. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To answer that, uh, it's a very specific nuance in the way that I said it, and. I had to step out of talking about it 24-7 because for, for me, my role, I, I felt intuitively my role is no longer to, to add to this part of the conversation. Whereas other people, I mean, like, so just to give a little context to that, since 2007, I've been researching this since gangbusters, like gangbusters. Since 2008, I've been making films about it. At a certain point, my evolution was stunted by sticking in a certain realm of conversation. Other people going down those rabbit holes is different because they arrived at that rabbit hole, many of them later, 
Many of them, when it was very, very obvious on the face of what's happening, were not being told the truth. And all those things are true. I mean, the Klaus Schwab's, the World Economic Forum, the fact that BlackRock owns almost everything, um, the fact that when you really look at paper trails, there's real um, conspiracies. And that's why I said, like, there's no way that you can throw it out and say that it doesn't exist. There are real conspiracies. And so... For other people, it does push the story forward for them and they're playing their role. For me, it was no longer my role. And the reason why I feel that is because I, you know, if I were to add words to my story, and this is partly contriving, but not really just making a story up of my role, it's more or less tuning into the realness of what I feel my role is. I started getting into this stuff back in 2008, 2009. Was I was making films about it. They were going mega viral, you know, 10 uh, million on um, some of the uh, some of the films like Esoteric Agenda and Chimatica. And then there was this long period between like 2010 and 2020 where I just kind of deviated into other parts of filmmaking. And then come 2020, a flood of new people start coming into this, wait a minute, I need to seek what's actually happening here because I can tell I'm not being told the truth from the top. I had already gone down that rabbit hole and I can't say that I emerged from it completely, but what I realized my role was, was not just to help those people feel like they're not insane and not to prove to them that they're right, but to show them how to deal with with the emotional residue, with the the psycho-emotional residue that happens when you start realizing you've been lied to systemically, systematically lied to. Like your family, everyone you ever loved, um, the, the conditions you live in, you've been lied to and you're continuing to be lied to. That is one thing to, to know that intellectually. It's another thing to embody it, mm -hmm. to make it into like in flesh it into the way that you live your day-to-day -day life. I was helping people embody it in a way where they didn't have to go buggy eyed and chain smoke cigarettes and sit in their basement, you know, researching nonstop. I was helping people live their lives because I went through it, let's say a decade before other people, some other people got into it. Now I feel like where it's headed from here is as there's much, many more people since 2020 starting to realize, okay, I actually don't believe that America has, you know, or let's say our government has my best interest in mind. I feel like many of them are downright crooks and should be in jail. And how do I reconcile the fact that I'm not going to leave this country? There's no other country I could go to to outrun what I see is actually happening. This is a global systemic problem. So then the the thing becomes for me, what are they going to face a few years down the line when when that story arc inside their mind and they start realizing because I had people when I first made films run off to the woods and try and go off grid. And a couple of them said, you know, I, I had to leave my family behind because they thought I was crazy. And I, I, I pleaded with them, please go back to your family like this thing isn't something you can outrun by running into the woods. Go be intimate with your family, like share love with the humans that you love. And if you don't, you're missing the point. You're not here to outrun problems and hide from them because you're clever. It's about transcending them in ways that you never thought that you would be capable of imagining and putting into practice. I think that's, I, I really do believe that we are, collectively about to um, face a huge crisis. And also many of us are then going to be faced simultaneously with the opportunity to transcend it or to get buried in the rubble of it. My job is no longer convincing people that there's infidelity at the top. I think that's that's a moot point. That's it, the people fucking already understand. understand of the century. People infidelity. already understand that. <laughs> let's let's yeah. just put it at that in the nicest way. Let's yeah, let's infidelity put it as infidelity. At the top. Okay. <laughs> let's just say in the nicest way, infidelity at the top. People are already waking up to that. Yeah. So what's next? That's what I'm feeling called to let go of this dive into the nuance and prove to people that there's infidelity. Now it's what do we do? How do we embody it? 
but not cower in the face of it, but stand up and not fight as if we're frantically trying to destroy it either, but simply like Buckminster Fuller said, render it obsolete by building the new world that we wish to live in. So that's kind of where I'm at in my my journey, uh, you know, and I have to say thank you to Conspiracy and thank you to how it, and also Psychedelics, because they both kind of like funneled me into a world of my own self-discovery by researching through books and listening to lectures, but also well over a decade, maybe 15 years of also letting all those lessons sink in. And many of them, they just go by the wayside. Some of them, they become embodied and I live them in principle. I don't just regurgitate them theoretically. I live them in principle. That's where I feel humanity is going to need to get to in an accelerated fashion because of the poly crisis that the whole world is facing right now. And much of the poly crisis is contrived and some of it is is so very real that when people wake up to it, they're going to feel sheepish. And maybe that's an understatement. They're going to feel absolutely terrible and stupid for not having woken up to this before. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of where I feel all my art is now pushing into. Let's develop the new story, which is no longer complete when you just say there's infidelity at the stop at the top. You also have to empower yourself to rise to that occasion. So mm -hmm. that's that's kind of where I'm at. So you're basically beyond the point of trying to convince people that this is going on and you're more about being figuring out if there is to be a world beyond whatever crisis we seem to be approaching that you need to figure out how to get people basically into that world mm -hmm. and and, and uh, or not even into that world to like to create that world first to empower them to engage with the real story that's happening. And there's this thing about story. Most people, and again, I'm drawing upon Mark Gaffney because of the words that he used is story isn't just contrived and fiction. We also uncover the story that we've been a part of. It's uncovering that there really is this kind of story arc to where, you know, pre-modern humans all the way through modern, through into post-modern human there's a story arc that's developing through this collective super organism, if you will. It's kind of like the net sum of all of our behaviors and actions, whether conscious or unconscious. When they come together, they produce this kind of epiphenomena that no one individual or no one institution has put into motion. Um, so it's kind of like a net effect to it. But, you know, no, I'm not trying to convince people of anything anymore. Like in, in the same, I was a musician before I was a filmmaker and I wouldn't get up on stage to convince people of anything, even if I had lyrics and my lyrics had a message to them. If you're moved by it, you're simply moved by it. If you're not, leave the dance floor. You know what I mean? It's one of the, it's the, one of those types of things. But let me ask you this, because I... I came to this realization that I feel is is getting deeper and deeper ingrained within me, and that's most people are behaving as such. They aren't like this, meaning that they're it's genetic, they can't change. But most people, they behave as if they are not looking for truth, they're looking for safety. So they will hide within numbers, even if they're parroting some stupid line that deep down inside they know is bullshit, but it's their party line. It's their clique, their tribe. This is their mantra. If I go against the mantra, I go against the tribe. So most people aren't looking to, to have their core beliefs rattled. They're looking for safety and they just want to feel good. They want to feel like they can live their lives. So I don't even blame them. I'm not sitting there calling them sheeple either. I understand also the, the net benefit of having I don't know, 80, maybe 90% of people just being followers. I'm fine with that because that really means, I mean, if you look at the American revolution, the low estimates say 2.5% of the American population and the high estimates say 4% of the population were engaged with the American revolution, which means everyone else were just waiting to see where the momentum was going to tip and then they'll follow that momentum. So the real movers and shakers are a small percentage of the population. That's who I'm speaking to. The ones who are actually looking, they're like, 
uh, I'm down this rabbit hole and all of this makes so much sense. I'm looking at the way the interconnectivity, the way that it makes so much sense, but I know there's something I'm missing. I'm speaking to those people that understand it's, it's, you're, you're correct about the story, mm. but you're incomplete. You're only at chapter five and there's much more to the story that'll make you go, aha, now I get it. This isn't a crisis of money or a specific type of person, or it, it's, it's a crisis of intimacy and confusion around the story that we are actually engaged in, in a way where we think we can circumvent it by being clever. We think we can outrun it somehow or, or hide from it. That's the reality that's going to smack people in the face. It's not that global warming is going to make it so hot within the next decade or that, you know, the the, um, the great reset and Klaus Schwab's agenda is going to literally imprison everybody within the next decade. It's that people within the next decade are going to wake up to the fact that they helped build this machine that is imprisoning them. That it's not all Klaus Schwab's fault. That's the thing that I think people are running away from right now. We love 100% placing it on the exterior. And then we just say, oh, well, I'm just an NPC. I didn't create this thing. I'm, I'm just dragged around by this chain around my neck. And we disempower ourselves so we don't feel the weight of the responsibility of the things we could do, the way we could engage. And we could, we can engage with what's happening right now. We can build community. We can start telling the new story. We can empower our neighbors. But in many ways, we still keep using the excuses of the previous story to confine us from actually engaging with the new story. That's that's at least how I see it. And that's why I'm not trying to convince people anymore. I'm just singing my song. And I hear other people singing along with it. Yeah. Okay, so I want to come back to this crisis of in intimacy and confusion surrounding the story. But before that, I am skeptical, right, that 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 people will do the right thing, or not even will do the right thing. I am skeptical that people are capable of that level of self-reflection, even myself, right? Because... I'm sitting here going, oh, well, how on earth did I help build this? And it's like, I probably contributed in some way, you know, and uh, as, we, as we all probably have, right? But it doesn't seem to be a very human reaction, unfortunately, to assume personal responsibility and blame for something that would easily be dismissed as being out of your hands, you know? We're all happy to slap, like, like the, it happens in the, in the UK when I watch people talk about how um, Britain is worse off because of Brexit, because we are not protected be, uh, by many of the, well, we're not protected by many of the regulations um, surrounding like environmental protections, consumer protections, employee protections, those sort of things, uh, tax regulation, whatever you want to say, that the EU has had in place and we are no longer bound by because we've left the European Union and they've started to strip back standards in some really awful things. Like like uh, there's been sewage dumped in into like water off the coast where people have been swimming. Like that's just one of the examples. But yeah things that have been detrimental to society and all of the, the the people who would like us to go back into the European Union basically their case is look this is all because of Brexit and it's like no we wanted to keep those regulations in place we would right and all the people who failed to make the case this case that like it is down to us to elect a government that will do those things that you want and you have to you have to like create a better reason than the people who are campaigning for other things and so far none of the people campaigning for the for the 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 supposedly like you know noble sensible regulation have managed to create a better story or or campaign or or political message than the people who would would destroy those regulations and they they sit and protect like they, they blame brexit this big unblameable like thing instead of trying to go okay how can we convince people to do this yeah uh, and it's the same so like I, i'm I, I and i watched this happen and you could watch it with anything like like the people who voted for joe biden 
Like they'll they'll sit there and be like, oh well, you know, why are why are gas prices so high? And it's like it's because he because he because he decided to to fucking stop the oil pipelines, man. Like you cut the supply of things, the the price is gonna go up. It's like you want green energy, invest in it. Make sure it's there, and then you cut off the pipelines, right? Mm. You don't just cut them off and they all sit there and be like, oh well, you know, how could we have known this was gonna happen? He was like, he fucking said he would do it. So I don't believe in people's ability or or <laughs> mental capacity to take responsibility. Like I don't believe my own in many cases. Like let alone other people. So like, w- what makes you think that like they will wake up and take this responsibility? I think we're going to be forced to, because I think what you are, and, and and this is just what I'm picking up on. But I think what you're touching upon, whether in yourself and other people is the death throes of the end of the old story. We th- this this whole we need a banner to fly Brexit, European Union, we need something to get under. We as people in this old story, we need power to help us build the new world. That's what it seems like we're stuck in this mental mode where we need to use the previous channels which we admit are corrupt. We still watch the news, even though we know they're lying, (laughs) right? We still use these channels because we actually don't know how else to behave on a day to day. We've ingrained it into our habituation. So for me, the way that I'm picking up what you're saying is I do actually believe people have the capacity, but their bandwidth is taken up by this old story, trying to save a dying empire. That's what it feels like to me. And they need to see it crumble before their eyes. Uh, have you have you ever? I mean, this is a, you know a very unique or interesting example. But have you ever heard where children and and actually this happened during COVID, um, but children's parents who died during COVID and the children never got a chance to see the dead body. So there's a part of them, and there's this article, I wish I could remember uh, where it was from, but it was just bringing up this point that I'd thought of in the past. The child needs closure, and the child, there's just this story now. Your Mm -hmm. parent's dead. Well, can I see them? Sorry, no, it's not safe, and it would scar you, because we think for some reason the truth of your parent's dead isn't scarring enough. Looking at the body would scar them further. I don't think so. I think that is actual closure. So that's that's an analogy that I'm going to make to I can intellectually tell you that the system is crawling uh, is crumbling and it's falling apart and we're going to be stepping into a brand new type of a world that you can't conceive of using the old model or the old lens of looking at the old story. Mm-hmm. You can't conceive of what's coming but you will be able to conceive it when what's taking up your bandwidth blinks out of existence. We see it crumble. We see it die. We're faced with the poly crisis. We don't look away anymore. We actually step into it and we understand that it's not that I made the decision that I that I own more than one seven billionth or even one ten billionth because we're talking about our ancestors as well that moved us to this point. I don't need to take on more responsibility than I must but actually it's not like I feel like I'm burdened by taking on the responsibility. I'm actually empowered by taking on the responsibility of realizing that this thing that I've engaged with, this story, this edifice, the infrastructure of our system that has massive infidelity, not just at the top, but systemic throughout the system needs to die for me to know it's dead and it's not coming back with a new face at the top of empire. Because if I don't know that it's dead, if I don't see it crumbling, if if it doesn't become real to me because I'm literally watching it crumble piece by piece, then a part of me is going to want to run back to that old on again, off again relationship. You know how like, when, you know, when you keep breaking up with the same person over and over again, there's something you don't want to let go of, but you know, it's fucking doomed. You know, in your heart, it's doomed, but there's a part of the story that hasn't been given closure. I think that's the difference between what we're talking about is when you're saying, I, I don't believe in people's capacity to self-reflect at this level. I agree right now. But once people, and I'm talking all people, 
are faced with this crisis and see it dying and realize just like a, a human body that's dying, there's this knowing like this person is not going to survive. When we come to see that this system is not going to survive in its pre present iteration, the quicker we come to that realization while in the company of support, so, so we don't just crumble into a puddle saying, "I'm it's useless, I just wanna die right now. There's, there's no story to carry us for, forward, we're done. If we were to step into that, realizing that, oh, there is something that can be done, then just the knowing of that causes for us to just tap into our intuition. And I know intuition is is this thing that many people might scoff at as like a new age thing. But I really do believe that we all have intuition. And it doesn't mean that your intuition is always right. It just means that there's always something, there's always some kind of compass inside of you that is pointing somewhere. And the more we refine that ability to like, oh, why do I want to read this book? I don't know. It doesn't have anything to do with what I'm researching, but I'm just going to flip open to a page. And all of a sudden you're like, shit, that's why I wanted to read this book. That's intuition. I think our intuition, once we see this whole thing crumbling, is going to tell, is going to wake a lot of people up in ways that we thought that they would need to meditate in a cave in a mountain for years to get to that point. But no, they just needed to remove all hope of reviving the old system that's dying. That's my thought on it. I do think we all have the capacity. So when you say like the, the bandwidth is taken up by by the current system, do you think that like the 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 collapse of the, the current system will involve like people losing like internet, smartphones, all these devices. Because I frequently, in my own life, find that these things tune me out of what I would prefer to be exploring intellectually or just within my own life. You know, they're, they're, a, very, they're a very good waste of time for exploring ideas that would potentially lead to these sorts of realizations do you so do you see this the this system collapses like everything like is going like you know no more instagram no more reddit no more pornhub like like all the things that waste the most time for people like no more fucking twitter like where are we going to get our meme no more memes like like, how, how, what do you think is going to be removed that, that is taking up the bandwidth? That's a very good question. No, I don't think social media and memes are going away. Um, no, I don't think smartphones and technology is going away. I believe they are going to continue more deeply embedding themselves inside the the just the the structure of our reality. They're, they may get better in a way. And I actually hold hope that um, right now, it, it's very obvious what the algorithms are looking for and they're looking for attention seconds. And they understand that outrage hitting your amygdala with a few sequences of words is the best way to keep your eyeballs on that screen. The answer is in the problem. The answer to, to that specific part of the problem is already evident when you illustrate the problem. We need algorithms that are more in line with what would actually empower us, not for one, outrage us, and for two, not what would just waste our time. But I think where technology and, and social media is at right now is at a point where it's showing how powerful it is, but it's also showing how disconnected it is from something that actually serves us. There are parts of it, uh, parts of all of that infrastructure that does serve us, and that's why it's not going away. It's obviously going to stay. But what's what's going to crumble? What's going to um, what is the old empire that is dying? I believe much of the same infrastructure is going to stay in place. It's the story, it's the glue that holds it together. So if I wanted to make a movie called Avatar or a movie called Jurassic Park, much of the same infrastructure to execute on those two stories are exactly the same. A couple of the few um, 
bits and pieces and elements that go into it are going to be radically different. I think that's what we're facing in the near future is what's going to crumble. We're not going to be sent into Mad Max territory. I don't believe that's what the future is going to look like. Um, I do believe there's going to be a hard correction in how much energy that we will be using in the next decade. That's informed mainly by Nate Hagen's um, who has the great simplification podcast. And whereas, you know, he has very specific, um, ideas of what's coming. He's also open to it's, it's probably not going to be this huge monstrous collapse, but even if you take a look at Americans using, well, I forget how much, maybe the average American uses a hundred barrels of oil and every barrel of oil, accounts for a worker in the field for five years. That's how much one barrel of oil what? at work it actually gives you. No fucking way. That's, I mean, and so reference Nate Hagen's for, for the specifics of how that's broken down. Um, he's He's got a lot of resources behind him, but that's how incredible oil is. is I, I forget exactly how many like, joules or, or kilo calories that we need during the day. And we utilize 100,000 times more energy than we need to to survive as an average American. And in other countries, this is different. So just imagine if you were to cut that by a third because of what's happening in Ukraine with, with that pipeline and the pipelines over here, or let's just say peak oil happened in the 70s and we've had diminishing returns ever since all the low hanging fruit and the most easily refinable oil has already been grabbed. Now we're talking about tar sands with far lower yield and it's going to take a lot more money. We can't pay a hundred dollars for a barrel of oil anymore because it doesn't factor into the cost, anything more than the extraction. It doesn't factor in refinement, shipping, the, the cleanup of pollution. It doesn't factor in any of those things. So, I think a collapse doesn't need a collapse of what I'm talking about, the story, the glue that's holding together the way that we're driving into the future, as Marshall McLuhan said, using only our rear view mirrors, the, the collapse isn't going to come by a complete infrastructure collapse. It may just come by every American and everyone in the civilized world has to use at least one third less energy we're going to feel that. We're going to feel it in how much we can surf the internet. We're going to feel that in how much we can use our air conditioning, how much we can put the heat on in the winter, how we use heat. Are we going to start going back to back early 1900s? Still, the dominant way of heating your home was going and collecting wood and, and burning it. I could see a radical change just in that tiny sliver of the change coming most Americans needing to go harvest wood to burn in a wood oven and most of their families hovering around this uh, stove, not because they absolutely have to, it's the only way, but they want their TV. So they're not going to use oil to heat their home. They're going to use wood to heat their home because they also want to watch TV. Mm -hmm. Imagine the kind of world when we just have to cut back a third in the amount of energy that we utilize. So if Nate Hagen's is correct, a collapse doesn't have to mean Mad Max. It could just mean a massive reduction very swiftly, like within a decade, mm -hmm. in the amount of consumption that can happen in the most um, developed nations. Isn't that what the current system wants us to do? What do you mean? Well, I mean, isn't that like... <laughs> We're being told by COP27 and, you know, the Bilderberg Group and Davos that we're going to need to cut our energy supply massively. Mm -hmm. um, my my feeling was always that that meant us, the, the, the average person, and never the people burning all the fuels. But, yeah. like, isn't isn't what you're describing, this, this, this collapse, isn't that, isn't that essentially what, what, what a lot of these people are, are kind of pushing us towards anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I would like to hear a deeper question on, on, underneath that. It's um, like, it's like, right. So like if, and I want to get to your story, like where you think the story goes, but like my, my first question is like, is, is it, 
Is the future you're presenting to us as the collapse of the system not equally possibly being engineered, encouraged, and then with the with the way with the with the possibility for that to be then controlled by the people who are collapsing the system? Hmm. You know, it's like I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a a coincidence. Yes, it's that, being contrived. Yeah, it's, it's like definitely being contrived by by individuals in the World Economic Forum, by top executives at BlackRock. Yeah. It's definitely being contrived. However, the the caveat to this, and and just so just so we're clear, the story that I think we're moving into is not utopia. I'm not saying once we get past this one hurdle fuck we could just sit back and sip our mai tais um no what i'm talking about is the story continues the problems change the the way we engage with new problems there's an element of the old but there's a brand new orientation that community is going to need to band together to really solve problems at a local level because infrastructure in some small part has either broken down or shifted its priority. Its priority is not all the the red areas. It's just the blue cities, uh, which have turned into smart grids, which is already happening. And I was talking about that in my first few films. The smart grid is real. It's coming. And that's a part of the contrived part of the story. Mm -hmm. I have to give it up for Mark Gaffney because some of what I'm saying is really put in that one podcast. Just listen to that Part one of the latest three podcasts on Aubrey Marcus uh, podcast, it's a lot of big words, so it, it might get nauseating to some people. But the reason why I'm mentioning this is the it was mentioned in there, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy. Mm -hmm. And there are elements of what's happening as being contrived. And that does not mean there's two things that 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 could mean and and also it's incomplete to say it's only one or the other. One is to say that BlackRock, World Economic Forum, Bilderberg, these elite groups are the only things in control of it. Not these super organism, nothing's left to chance. It's all 100% a chess move done by these groups. I don't believe that's complete. I believe that yes, it's being contrived by these groups and they have to, what they have to do is hijack the banners that we fly our grassroots revolutions under. So let's say Black Lives Matter was a grassroots revolution. And then, and, and I believe that it was co-opted from the start, but let's just say that it was a grassroots revolution and it had nothing but pure love and putting your foot down because of injustice. That's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And then corporate, and industrial processes come in and they hijack it and they turn it into something else. Mm -hmm. So people are still wearing the same exact shirt, flying the same banners, but now it's not the same vehicle and it's not headed to the same destination anymore. That's definitely true, but it cannot be said in my personal opinion that the 1% or the they that we're talking about are in complete control. They are not the only ones with their hands on the steering wheel. And what's driving this story is something that with their algorithms, with their supercomputers, with A-B testing through social media, and also trying to brainwash the, the masses through all this split testing and A-B testing on social media, they still don't have their hands squarely at, what is it, 10 and 2 on the steering wheel. There are, there are unimaginable, not just amounts of hands, but kinds of influences that steer that steering wheel that even the one percent doesn't have full control over they have more economic power which in this story right now is your king if you have massive economic power you are king you make rules at orders of magnitudes more influence than anybody else that is true but it's also incomplete i'm less convinced that it's just the they causing this problem but I don't ignore that that exists. Do you see how that's how I include the old story and I transcend it rather than throwing the old story out and now I just live happily and ignorantly inside this new story that's being developed. I see that old story, but I know that if Checkmate were right around the corner, 
I've been saying checkmate is right around the corner for well over a decade since I've been researching this. And I keep feeling like, oh, oh, this Ukraine thing, it's checkmate. And then something else will pop up. Oh, you know, when COVID happened, oh, that's checkmate. Then the Ukraine thing, checkmate. Oh, Kanye, checkmate. You know what I mean? Like there's all these things that happen, all these signs and wonders that happen that make us feel convinced that we know what's happening in its in its totality. I don't agree that any one of us know what's happening in its totality. I think we're authoring this story along with Klaus Schwab and the Bilderberg Group and with all those. We are authoring it as well. And we do have power in numbers. And there is a massive awakening to the bullshit that's coming out of these groups. I mean, think about it. World Economic Forum has been around since 1971. Yeah, and I can finally say it to a lot of mainstream people without them looking at me like I'm insane. <laughs> it's been around since 1971. Yeah. So what, what we're actually dealing with is not people being proven that there is an agenda in play. It's being, people are now waking up to, I've always heard that there was an agenda in play, but I always gave the benefit of the doubt to the fact that there's there's no conspiracy this could be explained in many other ways i think we're moving into the next part of the story whereas you can't move forward without realizing you've been lied to mm. you have to wake up to the fact that conspiracy is real but how you do it and how you move forward with it is extremely important because we're passing that baton on to future generations i realized when i started making conspiracy films that people, again, they were, they were leaving their family. They were running off into the woods. And I was like, what the fuck did I do? I didn't intend that. But because I made a film to empower people, now people are empowering themselves by leaving their families and making very rash decisions because I didn't understand my own power. I, I spent six months. I made one film. I reached millions of people and some of them left their families and ran off into the woods and made massive financial decisions because of words that I put to a soundtrack with some visuals. That's how powerful one person. And I didn't even realize I was that powerful. I was just possessed. I need to fucking say this to people. That's how powerful one person is. And now we have the infrastructure, these fucking phones, this computer that I'm working on, we had the ability to, I had the ability to make a film in with under $2,000 with cracked software. You kidding me? That reached millions of people. We have more power than we know. We just haven't, I didn't even have to go and do a bunch of research to figure that out. What I needed to do was accept the fact that I had been lied to and know that how do I rise to that, that occasion rather than cowering from it? I need to wake other people up to it. Maybe not all people will wake up to it, but I must. That must is the same thing that you've heard anecdotal stories of moms who they're not benching 500 and squatting 680 at the gym daily, but their kid gets trapped under a car and they lift 3000 pounds without their knees snapping or hurting their back. How the fuck did they do that without practice? It's because there's a different causal matrix than the the newtonian causal matrix in our mind so the conspiratorial klaus schwab does this now i'm experiencing this effect now i own nothing and it's his fault the, that is real but there's another causal matrix that we need to wake up to that will blow our fucking minds and the the hint of it is when a mother lifts a car off a baby and she doesn't go to the gym at all She's actually sitting down holding a baby. That's how she trains for that day. And she has not more than a moment's notice. She sees it. She must. So she then recruits everything possible at her disposal and she lifts the fucking car. There's no explanation for that when you're just coming from the intellect. There's no explanation for from it yet. And science may come to that point where it can explain it, but it shows you, you don't need an intellectual, scientific, sophisticated explanation to make something happen. That's what I think people are going, th that's the positive part of the story that we're going to come face to face with. One, we've been lied to and it's still happening and probably it's not going to go away anytime soon. However, we are going to rise to the occasion and we don't know what that means, nor does the Klaus Schwab's of the world know how powerful that awakening is actually going to be. And this is why all the, you know, when people say all oh, those Q-tards that believed all the Q-drops and stuff like that, I'm like, 
they're not completely retarded because when when they're talking about the great awakening there is something coming we know it in our bones there's something coming and there's a great reset oh i know it in my bones there's a fucking reset coming oh there's a great simplification that's about to happen i know it to be true i don't know how to explain it i can't point to external references to to back it up but i know it to be true this is what I think is going to happen in the next decade is many people are not going to need to fact check the shit in their head before they know it to be true. They're just going to engage with it like I knew people needed to hear what I had to say. So I made a film. I recruited everything at my disposal, cracked software, six months of my time, I quit my job and I made it happen. I didn't let anyone saying, oh, well, it's kind of unfeasible. How are you going to market it? You know, you know, how are you going to sell it? How are you going to distribute it? I didn't think of any of that shit. I didn't need to distract myself with it. So I, I know I got a little hot and heavy there explaining that, but that's actually what I'm excited about. What I see is happening is most people who are down the rabbit hole to get back to our first part of the conversation, they get stuck down the rabbit hole looking at how fucked we are. And they don't use any of their bandwidth to look at how powerful we are. So they get hypnotized by how right they are that we are being lied to and we're fucked. And they've used none of their imagination to conjure what lives inside them that knows that they are also just as powerful as the problem, if not more powerful. So that's, that's what's developing inside me as this new story comes to light. Hmm. So what is this causal what is this other causal matrix? Like what is the thing that you believe that they're tapping into? That's a good question. And I will say right away, I'm still tapping into it. Have you done psychedelics? No. No. The have you smoked kind? cannabis? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. So you, you you've taken cannabis. Um, have you seen a different reality because of that? Have you seen beyond a certain veil where you're like, whoa, like even modern, you know, or not modern, but like conventional ideas about what reality is, you take this plant and you're like, holy shit, that plant is talking to me. Mm. You've, you Have you ever had uh, a moment? Kind of. Similar? I mean, there was one time, a couple of times where I've been like, how the fuck did I not see this? Like, well, actually, that happens all the time where I get a properly new perspective on something. I'm like, oh, okay, that's how I need to think about it. Or that's a good way to think about it. At okay. one time where I took, uh, I smoked a joint that had had, uh, the, the weed had been in a bag that had mushrooms in it. So I started to get like hieroglyphics coming off the walls and had to take myself Whoa. outside for 10 minutes. Smoked a cigarette. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Don't free guy. <laughs> yeah. That's so the most, only reason I bring yeah. that up and, and, and who knows, maybe I do too many psychedelics. I don't even do them all the time. I have kids, mm. you know, um, but just in ceremonial settings. No, well, then don't, you know, you're, you're, you're right. If you feel, you know, those who say I'm feeling the calling, those are the ones who are ready. And it's, it, that's not some reason to think that you're lesser than if you're not ready, because some people do not need it. Mm. And some people, it's just, it's not their specific gift. It, it It's not the thing that will unlock their specific gifts. Yeah. So to get back to the causal matrix, I'm still tapping into it. Um, I'm still coming to um, see it, but I don't fully understand it. Um, the way that it's been explained is this causal matrix of something needs to happen in my exterior world in order, to, there needs to be a prime mover that I can point to, and it needs to be repro reproducible in the collective so other people can validate that what I'm seeing is not just a machination of my own mind. So there's this this idea that the only reality is the Newtonian. There's a prime mover and that moves something else and that sets the whole universe in motion. But these other causal matrices are this idea that your lived experience is also co-creating what reality is. I won't get into the weeds of this. I'm not even going to pretend that I fully understand it, but the recent Nobel Prize winner disproved local reality. So I'm not what even going to say- What do you mean disproved local reality? So th this was on Annika, um, what is her name? Annika Patrick or uh, Danica? Danica Patrick. Danica Patrick. Yeah. She had a podcast with this individual who was explaining this. That was just fantastic. 
And he was basically saying that disproving local reality means in, in the most succinct way I could say it is that when something is not being observed, it does not exist. That at least however it was um, shown by this Nobel laureate who then won the Nobel Prize, that our observation of a thing or an event or a phenomena is fundamental to it being real. And you cannot disassociate. So this is this, if you ever heard like a hippie say, oh, we're all one, it's it's all connected. It's all connected. Mm -hmm. It's true in this sense, if we run through this line of logic, that when, when something is not being perceived by anything, and I don't know how far down the sentient rabbit hole we need to go, does a bacteria living on it mean it's being observed? Does a cat observing it mean it's being observed? Does it have to be humans observing it? And also Rupert Sheldrake showed you that- You can't prove, you can't, you can't measure that. No. Double no, slit experiment, not, it, isn't it? Like you can't, you can't prove that. No, well, like that's- Unless you that's can my ask first... the cat what they've seen or ask the right. amoeba, you can't- <laughs> Right. Because you have and, to and measure it, you know? <laughs> but I think what we're touching upon here is ask the cat- and the cat will give you their subjective, their relational, and their Newtonian causal explanation of it. You cannot disassociate one from another. So, like the the thing that that I'm staying away from in this part of the topic is what happens to this desk when it's not being observed. It disappears. Does that mean everything falls? You know, everything that's on this desk? No, because none of that shit's being observed either. Rupert Sheldrake also showed that um, ob observation changes the nature of a thing, even when you film it and no humans are looking at it yet. But this also goes into the quantum retrograde causality uh, thing where it once it is observed, it doesn't matter. The, the whole idea of space time is irrelevant on some scale of reality on some scale of reality. So this is where you're talking to a filmmaker, you're not talking to a physicist, you're not talking to the to the one to the to the Nobel Prize winner. I'm using this as an example to show that the causal matrices that and and so like also so I can show your audience that I'm not trying to prove this as real. I'm showing what is resonating as a new emerging story. And what that is, is you cannot dissociate the reality of your inner lived experience with the outer experience completely. There may be differences such as once I witness a thing, then my mind takes over and starts to twist it in how I remember it. But that's not the event. That's stored in my memory. That's not the event. That is there for me to recall it from a pattern of neurology and then bring it out at a new moment in time. So that's not the event. So what we witness, oftentimes you, you'll you have heard, we'll witness a paradox in reality, but it won't blow our mind. We'll just pass it off as, oh, my mind's playing tricks on me. Mm -hmm. So we have these mundane ways of pa passing off things that would actually blow our mind if we drilled into it a little bit more. So I, I want to just, so I'm not just meandering into infinity, come back to the original question. The, the new causal matrices that I'm speaking of, I'm still coming to an understanding of, but what I really believe they are is the shared collective story that we are authoring together. The story, so many people think that a story is just make-believe. It's just something that you contrive. But this flies in the face of the fact that for us to string a story together, it has to come through us in some way. So in a way, through our um, through our felt sense of the story being alive in us, we somehow resonate that out in our words, in the story, and others put that into a framework and a context. That context is like mimetic engineering. Think of how a meme not only gives you information to consider, you know, so it, it'll show you, I forget whose wedding. It, it might've been, um, uh, uh, the, the, the royal family, but at, at, at some like royal wedding, there was uh, Ghislaine Maxwell peeking her head out. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe mm -hmm. the Clintons right next to it. Mm -hmm. That story yeah, says yeah. a ton right there. But the words you put above that is going to 
alter that. That's a story that you're adding to a picture. So there's the real thing that happened. Ghislaine was there with the Clintons. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then you're going to add a piece of the story to it. The, what does that do? Does that change the, the event? Does that change the reality of it? Or does it implant the way that that part of reality sits inside your consciousness with these words? Mm -hmm. So you, you put some words at the top and then that helps it root itself into the context of the story that you live by. I, I if, if I'm to just make this simple, so, so we don't just keep rambling on about this, or I keep rambling on about this story has so much more force and effect in the way that we tell ourselves the four minute mile is impossible until somebody does it. And now thousands of people have done it mm. because one person did it. One person disproved it was wrong. And then that seeming brick wall where all the doctors said your knees will break, your your heart will you know um, explode, <laughs> your lungs will collapse. And then none of that stuff is true mm. if you don't believe it. And you also have at least some capacity to overcome that physical obstacle. That's what I think we're experiencing is a collapsing of the story that told us we were something that we are not. I started twitching, probably telling me to stop rambling. Yeah. So what, is there any truth to the current story? Yeah. Yeah. Um, all stories, they, they have their, their reason for being there. Again, like it's, it's, it's a nuanced conversation because a lot of people try to use reductionist logic to parse it back out into their appropriate categories and remove the connectors between them. The old story is the only way that we got here. You know, mm -hmm. it is the only way. And you could say, oh, well, it could have gone differently. Sure, sure it could have, could but have. it didn't. This yeah. is the way that it went to get us here. So the old story, um, I, I think here's how I'll say it. The yin yang, the the whole idea of everything has its counter, mm -hmm. the the light casts its own shadow, right? And so what we're talking about here is the the original the, the original mover, the thing that moved this story into motion, also has its shadow, its effect that no one could have foreseen, and that effect is also what we have lived. Our ancestors lived it all the way up until now. We've lived this story, but we couldn't understand exactly where it was pushing us until now. And so it's been said that we are living in catastrophic and existential risk, a time where this is being thrust in our face. Mm -hmm. It's not just a story that that there's existential risk happening. It's not just a story anymore. It's right in our face. But the beauty, the the other side of that, it's not just a horror story. The other side of that is when the horrific aspect of that becomes so um, inevitable, we can't turn our eyes from it. There's no way we can ignore it anymore. Then it, in a sense, unlocks the codes of our genes as, as a manner of speaking for us collectively to realize, okay, nobody, no billionaire, no government, no group, no one else is actually coming to our rescue. Nobody's doing a goddamn thing because everyone's still trying to maximize the old story, which is what put us into this place. So everyone's still trying to maximize, I'm better than you. I want this opportunity. It's not a collective thing. It's a win-lose metrics type of scenario. And in a sense, I don't even think we're done with that yet. We have a few more years of it getting worse that's my personal opinion. We're going to see things get worse and that's what's going to force it in our face that we must change. Not somebody else, not some government. We're not here to tweet so often that hopefully the next president does what the world needs. We're going to have to come face to face with the fact that no president, not even Klaus Schwab could stop what's actually happening if he had a change of heart. Mm -hmm. I, I don't believe that. And, and when the Klaus Schwab's and the Bilderberg's and the elite do come face to face with it is probably going to be after the masses have come face to face with it. Ooh. 
Well, it's going to become after. And uh, I do think they're fl- they're afraid of blood. They're afraid that they know that nobody buys their bullshit they're anymore. They're afraid of their blood. Well, that, that's what I mean. They're <laughs> afraid of their blood on others' hands because they were the ones who maximized the old story latest. They're the latest to show up. They're the ones that are still doing it. So maybe there will be blood. You know, and I, in many ways, I think part of the story also has to be how do we move forward into this next part of the story without looking for blood, without the need, the absolute necessity? I don't think we're going to eradicate it. I think people are still going to ask for blood, but some of us are going to have to set the example. How do we move into this new story? not by forgiving other people and just turning the other cheek and letting them have their McMansions. I'm talking about how do we move into this story without doing what every empire has done before us, and that is turn the previous rulers into the number one enemies and using them as an example. Let's take their heads so now me, the new ruler, can show you all the now new sheeple that I have your best interest in mind. And that just keeps the same old wheel of suffering and empire turning. There needs to be a difference this time. And if there isn't, if a new empire just steps in, if Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum get exactly what they want with no resistance, if we just bow down and and allow them the world they're looking for, I think it's game over for them as well. It's game over for all of us. And what I'm looking for What I'm looking for is for people not to try and intellectualize what the new story must be, just like I did and like that mom did when she saw her child under that car. Know that the new story must be something revolutionary, not just a rebranding of the old empire story. Well, that feels like an absolutely stunning place to 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 wrap things up. That's quite the the fucking statement to finish things with, man. Um, this has been fascinating, um, no, absolute pleasure, and yeah, we've blasted well past an hour. Um, so, yeah, man, I, I want to thank you. Uh, is there anything you want to point people towards, like your work, Twitter, YouTube? Yeah, I'll point people towards two things. Go to benjosephstewart.com so you can check out all my content. I put it out regularly. Um, and, uh, I'll point people towards the fact that we didn't even touch DMT once in this conversation. And th- that was where I thought we were going with this. Um, it's interesting that, uh, this conversation just kind of went where it wanted to. I appreciate the, uh, flexibility. Yeah, man. I was, I was going to say, I'm not as good at keeping things on track as you are. <laughs> I get distracted. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. Uh... But, this was fun. I appreciate it. Yeah, well, we'll have you back. If you're in the UK at some point, man, give me a shout. We'll do it in person. We'll do. I don't know what yeah. the travel arrangements are like for you. But um, yeah, I, I will stick links for that in the description below for everyone. And um, yeah, talk to you again, man. Appreciate it. Hey, everyone. Thanks for making it right the way to the end of the podcast. I love that you tuned in this long. Do me a favor, hit subscribe because 80% of you bastards are not subscribing, but you're watching my videos. See you next time. So whenever I'd be out for a walk, whenever I was going to cook dinner, whenever I was doing cleaning, I always used to spend my time listening to music. And I still really enjoy listening to a lot of music. But what I've discovered is that I can consume so many more books when I'm using something like Open Audible. It's a fantastic, fantastic way for me to make my way through all the things I have to read for this podcast, for things I want to read for fun. That's like fiction and nonfiction. Sometimes I actually prefer fiction when it's being read to me. Uh, I like someone doing the voices, like someone, you know, really getting into the characters. In the case of both fiction and nonfiction, it allows me to spend way more time visualizing what I'm reading. So I can think more about the ideas. I can think more about the scenes that people are trying to paint. And ultimately it just gives my brain more space to think because I'm not concentrating on the words in front of me or trying to stay focused on it. Instead, I can just sort of mindlessly get on with whatever task I'm doing and listening via Open Audible. Now, the reason Open Audible is great is because it allows me to do it straight from my desktop. I try to stay away from my phone as much as possible in order to sort of maximize my productivity because it can be a very fast way to waste half an hour. Whereas if I just open my laptop and 
hit play on Open Audible. I can connect it to my Bluetooth speaker, and then I don't even have to go anywhere near my phone. Do you like free stuff? I'm sure you do. Well, I'm going to give away a free copy of Open Audible to one lucky person that signs up for my mailing list in the next month. Now, those of you who are already signed up, don't worry. You can be involved in the draw as well. Just give me a rating or review on Spotify, Apple, wherever you get your podcasts and post it on Twitter. Send it to me via email. Respond to something I've posted on YouTube. Somewhere you can prove you've got a screenshot and I will enter you in the draw. I have to admit, I used to be a little bit of a book snob. I wouldn't even consider a Kindle, let alone an audiobook. It just felt like cheating. But that is until I tried Audible and Open Audible. Ever wonder where I find the time to read all the books that my guests have written on this show? Well, this is the answer. When I'm behind in my reading, I just jump to audiobook. Open Audible is a cross-platform audiobook manager designed for Audible users that can allow you to download, view, manage, and connect your favorite audiobooks on MP3 so that you can enjoy them across all your devices. Best of all, you can control it all from a desktop application. I'm giving away a copy of Open Audible for the entire month of November. All you have to do is sign up to my mailing list. You'll find the link in the description below or go to openaudible.org for more information.